last session is focusing on how do we move towards a sustainable and smart cities. And for that, we have assembled a group of academic and non-academic speakers. Uh, two of our speakers are academic and two from uh, Microsoft and AT&T. And we're going to first, uh, in order to improve the, just the flow of this, we're going to actually first do the two academic followed by the, by the two non-academic speakers. And, um, and I'm, I'll uh, take questions as we, after each speaker. Um, and then if you have time at the end, we can have, a, have uh, some questions for all of our speakers. So please be thinking of your questions as, as they're speaking. Um, our first speaker for, for today is uh, Bill Sullivan. And Bill Sullivan is a professor and head in the Department of Landscape Architecture and has been working a lot on looking at uh, how do we make uh, communities much more sustainable and healthy and, and, um, and viable. So I'm going to ask Bill to... Thank you, Madhu. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to speak about uh, some emerging ideas that are occurring to a group of us on campus, thinking about how we might turn campus in Champaign-Urbana into a test bed for smart communities. This is Stephen Kaplan. Uh, professor of psychology at the University of Michigan. He passed away uh, in July. He, he talked about humans as information processing creatures. He said our evolutionary advantage was our capacity to deal effectively with information. And this makes sense, right? We, didn't, we couldn't run fast. We, could, we didn't have big claws. We couldn't um, climb very quickly uh, or outcompete many of the creatures in the habitat that we existed in for the last couple million years. But we had the capacity to process information and make sense of things in a way that um, other animals couldn't. And uh, Kaplan argued that our connection to information is alive and well today. Indeed, we trade it, we hoard it, we go to incredible lengths to procure it. I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes you waste an enormous amount of time um, with information that doesn't really advance your own goals or your own purposes in the moment. Is that just me, or has anybody spent two hours on YouTube? Um, yeah, OK, good. Thank you very much. We love information. But there's so much information out there. There's so much to do, so much to keep track of and so much information bombarding us uh, at any given time that we very often get overwhelmed. If you're like me, maybe you had this hope that these, um, these tools were gonna save you. Have you ever imagined that, oh, if I just get that next tool, I'll, I'll be fine? These guys have, these guys right here, they, they have. Um, that, that uh, the, the new version of the iPhone, and some technical difficulties here, the, or the, the, the next Echo um, or Alexa was, was going to um, address, was going to address the needs. Um, the, the problem is that, um, that I've found is that the, the more I've engaged more deeply with these things, um, the more targeted that information gets to be, and the more difficult it becomes to ignore stuff that's interesting and engaging but doesn't really meet my goals or my agenda at any given moment. And then comes the Internet of Things. Just when we thought uh, we might be, not be able to take any more. Along comes the Internet of Things, which promises a great deal. But it's not clear yet how the Internet of Things is going to deliver on these promises. And now we're talking about, in, in um, landscape architecture and in urban planning and architecture, we're talking about the city of things, an interconnected network of sensors that are feeding information across um, uh, Wi-Fi and 4G and soon 5G networks to um, create even that much more information um, from smart streetlights to smart meters to smart energy grids 
um, and on and on and on, smart healthcare kinds of related issues, smart education kinds of issues. The problem for us normal human beings, and I'm, I'm not talking about these two guys right here because they're not normal. The problem for us normal human beings is that these are almost all individual streams of information that are not connected to each other in any way that makes sense to us. And they're far less connected to our personal or individual agendas, to the kinds of things that we're trying to achieve, like keeping the slide on. <laughs> I am checking the connection. <laughs> Who the heck has the capacity to learn about all these things and take advantage of the enormous uh, throughput of information that is promised by a city of things. Now imagine for a moment that you lived in a community in which the flow of information came to you in a way that was filtered to support your agenda, your decision making and your goals, and your ability to meet those goals. It, well, it's all, yeah, it's all the way in, but maybe it's, maybe it's having, okay, it's on again. So, Maybe it's time for a new computer, or maybe it's time for a new cord, I don't know. What if, what if such a system was also connected to your neighbors or your associates in a way that actually built community instead of dividing us into smaller and smaller segments that serve advertisers and corporations instead of us? Imagine living in a place in which the sensors in the environment and the computing power underlying these sensors worked in concert with your goals in a way that enhanced your capabilities. With the encouragement of uh, the provost, and a, uh, a group of us have come together to begin exploring these possibilities. We're trying to figure out how we might develop a system that builds on the promise of the Internet of Things or the City of Things, while at the same time understanding and respecting the limitations related to human information processing. As a group, we exist to use the Internet of Things to enhance human capabilities in order to do a number of things, in order to create healthier, safer, more equitable, sustainable places, to enable better decision-making, to encourage the development of community ties, and fuel innovation for all residents. So here's a, that's, the, that's the summary of the big goals of the small group that, of why we exist. Healthier, safer, more equitable places, enable better decision making, develop community, fuel innovation, all the while respecting in li our limited capacity to pay attention. How in the world might we go about this? Well, we're back to these things. Um, we imagine a single interface on a smart device, such as a smartphone. We propose to initially use our campus as a test bed and then grow that to include Champaign and Urbana and then the corridor out to, um, out to Willard as the initial test bed. We propose uh, in the first year that we um, create a platform or an interface that would integrate My Illini. Most of you don't know what My Illini is, but if you're a student, you spend a lot of time uh, going to My Illini and making sure you've done the right things. Uh, financial aid, transportation and wayfinding, health and wellness. Now, what's a model for this? How might we do this? Well, we're working with an alum, a fine fellow with two first names. His name is John Paul. He graduated uh, in engineering in uh, 76 or so. And he started a corporation. He's worked for many, many Silicon Valley startups. Now he's, 
He's the uh, founder and, and uh, CEO of a, of a uh, corporation called Venue Next. And they've, they've used this, a similar idea at a much smaller scale than we're talking about. Uh, and they developed this initially for um, the San Francisco 49ers football team. Uh, the 49ers built uh, Levi Stadium five years ago, and they wanted to be cutting edge, the most dynamic, engaged, um, connected uh, fan experience possible. The, uh, the tool that they've got here is going to be a model for what we're thinking about developing. And this tool, it does some interesting things. It knows, for instance, that you're going to go to the 49ers game because you've got tickets. And it knows, because you've scanned your phone and identified your phone, it knows where you are and what day it is. If it's the day before the game, you see the home screen up promoting a bunch of things related to the game. If it's the morning of the game and it knows that you're not uh, at the stadium, it shows you the fastest routes to get to the stadium. If you want to take transit or you want to take your automobile or you want to ride your bike, it shows you the pathways. Once you get to the stadium, it knows you're in the, it knows you're in the parking lot, all that transit information disappears. And what comes up on your phone are your tickets. And you walk to the gate at Levi Stadium and you scan your tickets. And as soon as you scan your tickets, that disappears and up comes a screen that tells you how to get to your seat. Once you get to your seat, you have two op it gives you two options. One is a menu of food that you can order that they will then bring to you in 15 minutes. The other, of course, is um, the location of the nearest restrooms and the length of the lines associated with each restroom. Can you see how this is beginning to um, be a system that, um, that we might develop because it, it anticipates what people want and it, and it moves away out of their uh, screen view information that's no longer necessary or needed or relevant to their, to their goals. Now this is a relatively, I think they did a great job with this for a football game, but a, a campus or a city is so much more rich and complex than a, than a football game or a concert uh, or even a healthcare system. So the challenge that we're facing is um, to do some deep dives into this uh, process in an effort to um, explore how we might use this as a model for students coming here on campus and then and to the larger community. Now you might ask, why here? Why, why at a university? These guys are very smart and they work for powerful um, international corporations that have a lot more money um, to develop something like this than, than we have. So why would we step into this domain and imagine that we might um, do something impactful here? And I would argue it's because, because we are a university, because we're committed to the public good. We see doing this in an open platform fashion uh, that anyone could be able to use uh, in any campus or any city around the world, and that anyone would be invited to contribute to as well. We are also, as, and you've got a sense of this from, the, from your participation in this event, we have people that think deeply about the technology side, but we also have people that think about social issues and equity and access, and we'll bring those people to the table and make sure that we build this in a way that, um, that the financial engagement um, of the participants is not the driving force for why, for why this will be successful. And why here at Illinois? Well, here at Illinois, we've got um, an enormous and profound uh, and happy track record of making these kinds of innovations and having global impact um, from, from the kinds of um, inventions and patents and uh, um, high-tech, high-information um, uh, discoveries that we've made. And we've got a group of people here who are interested in working together to, uh, to do exactly that. And uh, we're looking to the provost and the chancellor to uh, encourage them to make this part of our strategic plan. We hope that that will happen and that uh, we'll begin to use our campus initially and then Champaign and Urbana as a test bed to um, explore an integrated 
user-focused or human-focused uh, testbed for smart communities. Thank you. started thinking about smart uh, cities right here on our campus. We have time for a couple of quick questions. You want to raise your hand and we'll get you the microphone. Thank you for the talk. My question is what is your vision for privacy in a smart city, or do I have to live with seeing ads for comfortable shoes every time I walk? Yeah, so privacy is an enormous challenge that um, we've, got a, we've got a portion of our team exploring that, and the way we're gonna address that is we're working with, we're doing focus groups um, in the coming six weeks with students to help, to help us understand um, the issues that they're concerned about and ways they might opt in. There's also uh, questions about encrypting data, we have to, we, to do this well, if we're gonna include um, uh, application information and financial aid information, uh, perhaps uh, health and wellness information, we're, we will certainly conf um, meet the requirements of FERPA and HIPAA uh, and we'll encode and encrypt information to, to protect it. I can't tell you the exact, I, I don't have the answer to that yet, I, but I can tell you that we're very concerned about that and we're taking it very, um, uh, seriously in, a, in our move forward. Thanks, Bill, it's a, a promising vision. I'm, I'm thinking a, a little bit about the value of serendipity and the, and the friction um, of congestion and wondering about your thoughts about how the removal of congestion and friction and the clarity of your path uh, we, we might be sort of losing something on the serendipity front, um, but maybe it's already lost because everybody has their faces in their machine anyway, and so you don't see the opportunity or you don't have the moments of reverie that you may be used to before you had the machine. So, uh, you know, have you, have you thought a little bit about what we might be giving up as we, as we make our paths clearer? Yeah, thank you, Rolf. That, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. And... Um, we, we have talked about that, and we've talked about how, well, what if, what if it doesn't... So there, there's two kinds of serendipity, right? There's the serendipity of what doesn't get um, up on your screen that you might want to do in that moment. And the other serendipity is there's somebody walking by you who you'd like to meet and talk to, and, you, and like you say, you got your face here and you don't see that person. So um, these are important questions, and uh, one, of the, one of the other reasons that we want to do this here is because we've got a group of people who are dedicated to asking these kinds of questions. We can collect data on these, we can run scenarios, we can explore hypotheses and, um, and figure out ways to, um, to create uh, an interface that lets people opt in and out um, at, uh, at a pace at a pace that's, that, um, that may be individualized for them for, for their level of um, how deep they want to go in, for instance. Yeah. Do we have time for one more, or is that it? Uh, well, let's hold it till the end. If you have time. Okay, so, yeah, sure. Yeah, All right, thank you. Uh, thanks. Oh, I got the mic. <laughs> okay, uh, we're gonna switch orders a little bit. So we have um, Zoe Hampstead next, and Zoe is an assistant professor of environmental planning at the University of Buffalo. Uh, does a lot of interdisciplinary plenary work and looking at in particular on um, a vulnerability to heat and cold events. And today she's going to talk about thermally comfortable communities. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to participate in this Congress. I've learned so much over the last three days, and it's, it's been a real privilege um, to see this campus and learn about all the exciting research that's happening. Um, so I'm going to be talking about thermally comfortable communities. If you saw Professor Chakraborty's talk um, first thing this morning, then you already have a lot of good background on the importance of temperature-related vulnerabilities. I'm gonna make the argument in my talk that smart technologies can be a really useful way at better understanding 
thermal vulnerability and thermal comfort. But I really want to reiterate the points that were made in the previous talk about how the decisions we make to deploy smart technology, the data we collect, and for whom that data is collected, need to be driven by community values. So toward the end of my talk, I'm going to share a little bit about a project in which we're collaborating with local governments and researchers across different climatic contexts to set up a process for understanding how technology, how smart technologies and data that we collect from smart technologies can best support our community values in the context of trying to protect people against the impacts of thermal extremes. Um, and so this project is a collaboration between City of Buffalo and Erie County, in which Buffalo is located, um, Maricopa County and Tempe, Arizona, and researchers at University at Buffalo and Arizona State University. One of the most effective ways we have of communicating the threats that heat and cold events pose is through fatality rate statistics. And so this graph is showing um, crude, wet, crude rates for weather-related mortality. So crude rates means that we're looking at hospitalization codes for incidences like um, sunstroke, heat stroke, hypothermia. So those kinds of deaths that we can directly attribute to weather. And the Center for Disease Control estimates that over a five-year period, out of um, roughly 10,500 weather-related deaths, about 63% were directly attributable to cold, 31% directly attributable to heat, and the remainder were due to things like floods, um, storms, and lightning. And I think, you know, in the United States and globally, communities are beginning to understand the importance of temperature as a driver of heat impacts. Um, even though, you know, I think for quite a bit of our history, we were more concerned about storms that you can watch come in on a radar and you see, you know, have the, these really destructive impacts on infrastructure, but we're beginning to better understand the impacts of these more um, silent killers. And you can, you can see from this graph how the risk of mortality due to heat and cold, not so much with other kinds of storms, increases with age. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot better understanding now that people who have reduced mobility or live in social isolation are more, more vulnerable to the impacts of these kinds of events. And so, you know, the research in this field has tried to sort of unpack, like, what um, what are the patterns of risk to, um, in particular, heat events? And so what you're looking at is a map that's showing a 14-year data set of 107 urban communities across the United States. The size of the dot represents the effect, which is heat-related mortality. So the bigger the dot, the more heat-related fatality associated with a heat wave. And as we heard Earlier this morning from Dr. Chakraborty, heat wave is a relative term. So in Buffalo, you know, a, heat, a 99th percentile hot temperature day is upper 90s, whereas in Tempe, Arizona, it's more like 110 or 112 degrees. Um, and so this, again, the size of the dot represents mortality, and the redder the or the red dots represent higher confidence level. So big red dots are bad in essence. And so raise your hand if you're surprised by the pattern that you're looking at in this map. Yeah, it's a little bit unintuitive that communities in the northern United States and the Midwest are experiencing higher risk of mortality during heat wave events than communities in the south. And we also see that effect in the western United States. Um, and so this graph is sort of showing the same phenomena in a slightly different way where we're looking at how the risk of mortality changes with changes in temperature. And so you have the x-axis going from negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit cold um, to roughly 90 degrees Fahrenheit warm. And what you're seeing is that you know, there's high risk, of course, on the cold and heat extremes. But what's sort of revealing in terms of the geographic distribution is that the solid line represents northern cities and the dotted line represents southern cities. So if you take something like 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which in Buffalo we might consider to be a quite mild winter degree day, there are a couple of southern cities represented by those dotted lines that are experiencing very elevated risks of mortality. And then, you know, we have this, what we might think of as being a thermally comfortable zone where the line dips 
somewhere between 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And then, um, of course, we get these spikes in heat-related mortality um, in northern cities on the higher end. So, you know, as I mentioned, we might think, okay, well, there's some sort of thermally comfortable zone that we might be trying to achieve in our urban environments. And we can think about both the indoor urban environment and the outdoor urban environment. But thermal comfort is very subjective. And we know that it's linked to a lot of sort of individual and household level um, characteristics, as well as environmental characteristics. So to demonstrate this, we're going to do a highly scientific study right here in real time. Um, so I'm going to poll you on how comfortable you're feeling right now. So um, neutral means that you feel pretty comfortable. You're not too cold or too warm. Um, being co cold or cool or warm means that you're maybe a little bit uncomfortable, but being very cold or very hot means that you're very, you're very uncomfortable. So to respond to this poll, I would like you to stand up because we've all been sitting for too long and we need to take a stretch. So don't stand up yet. Sorry, don't stand up yet. Okay, okay so if you're feeling neutral, stand up. Okay, good number of people are feeling good. Um, that says something about your building operations, I guess. Um, so if you're feeling, so sit down if you're neutral. If you're feeling cool, stand up. If you're feeling a little bit cool. Okay, so quite a few people are a little bit cool. Sit down. If you're feeling very cold, so you're very uncomfortably cold. All right. Out in the hallway. Yes, I felt that when I was out in the hallway. I was uncomfortably cold. Okay, if you're warm, stand up. Okay, so a few folks are a little bit too warm. Okay, sit down. And if you're very hot. Okay, so we were actually like in a pretty comfortable range compared to other contexts in which um, I've taken this poll. But still we see that there is variation, like even in this room where we're all being exposed to the same thermal conditions, we have different experiences. And what this is telling us is that the instruments that we use to measure thermal conditions are not a perfect way to capture what people are actually experiencing. And so the way that we you know, generally frame vulnerability, and Dr. Tracker Bordis talked did a really good job of describing this, is in terms of you know, both those environmental conditions, but also social sensitivity conditions. So exposures, we might think of being an event, like a heat wave of some length and duration, and then the biophysical components of the urban environment that can either attenuate or exacerbate that, that event. And then sensitivity are the coping capacities that individuals and households and communities have um, to withstand that event. So you might live in a floodplain, but if you have flood insurance or you have pretty good mobility access to an automobile, economic resources to stay in a hotel, then you're not going to you know, suffer the same level of um, vulnerability. Um, and, then, and then adaptive capacity is the other component that he talked about. And so this is where we're thinking about what is the potentiality for individuals or households or communities to change those exposure and sensitivity um, the, uh, conditions in ways that reduce their vulnerability. And as he rightly mentioned, this is where there's really a huge gap in the research. And so some scholars have um, made the point that we really need to be doing more kind of qualitative research work to understand what people's adaptive capacities are. What, is the, what are the knowledge and practices um, and agency that, are, that people are bringing um, to, to this question? Uh, and it's much harder to get at. So the way in which you know, I've been sort of looking at adaptive capacities in the context of my research is that um, you know, we can try to understand where is that exposure sensitivity overlap in the Venn diagram, and how can we you know, begin to address that um, through adaptive practices. And so some of the ways we measure it, you know, exposure are by looking at things like satellite um, derived land surface temperature. So this is like an indicator of exposure that we're looking at. Um, these maps are from a project that my lab is collaborating on with um, Urban Resilience to Extremes, which is an Arizona State University-led um, sustainability research network fun funded by the National Science Foundation. And the project is looking at different types of extreme events in 10 cities across North Central and South America. One of the core research activities is to conduct scenario workshops 
um, with communities in all of these cities to try to imagine, vision, future scenarios for urban resilience in the context of climate change. And so this kind of vulnerability mapping is serving as a sort of baseline um, from which we can project future scenarios based on um, communities' goals. And so we're looking at Hermosillo, Mexico and the um, map on the left and the watershed um, within which Baltimore is situated on the right. Um, and then these are some, some sensitivity maps of Baltimore so we know you know, and sometimes we know this in a place-based way that there are certain social groups that are um, more at risk to heat-related mortality, and so we try to capture those place-based indicators if we can, you know, so for example, um, living alone, or we know that um, racial and ethnic minority groups, groups that have been historically disenfranchised tend to have higher risk of um, heat-related illness. And so those are the kinds of things that we look at, and then you know, we try to look at their intersections. So this, these are maps of New York City where we were using a cluster analysis to identify surface temperature hotspots um, and counting the different um, potentially vulnerable social groups that live within them. And we found that you know, households living in poverty, African Americans, and Hispanic populations um, are disproportionately represented within those hot clusters. Okay, so this is how I would characterize sort of the state of vulnerability research at this point, right, we're using these indicators that we can easily drive from the census or from um, in, in environmental indicators to try to capture vulnerability. But what we're missing is that we don't really have great information about people's experiences with thermal comfort, and so we don't necessarily the understand the mechanisms through which vulnerability comes about. So if I'm someone who's on a fixed income and I'm living in an upper floor apartment um, that doesn't have good airflow and I don't have air conditioning, but say I have like a window air conditioning unit, um, am I, if I'm facing potentially really high energy bills, am I going to forego that energy and just suffer perhaps the direct health impacts of being thermally uncomfortable, or maybe I will consume energy and give up something else really important to my health, like medicine or caloric intake, right? We don't really understand how people are sort of navigating this, this um, their efforts to become thermally comfortable. And so therefore, we don't necessarily understand what kinds of actions we should be taking. Um, so in, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a pilot project that we're conducting um, in Erie County, in which Buffalo is located. So Erie County, when we um, experience a 90 degree day, we see an increased um, mortality rate of 14% over a 70 degree day. So we think there's like good reason to suspect that this is an issue in Erie County. Um, I'm gonna go a little bit more quickly than I expected to because I'm running short on time. Um, but one of the vulnerabilities that I wanted to point out about a place like Buffalo is that 80% of our housing stock was built before 1930. Um, and we have you know, very strong patterns of social vulnerability that are sort of aligned with this whole older housing stock, um, primarily renter neighborhoods, um, where the landlords are not keen to do things like weatherization. Um, and so the housing stock represents a really important sensitivity that we need to account for in an older city like Buffalo. The Union of Concerned Science, um, Scientists has projected that under a higher emission scenario, Buffalo could experience almost 50 days above 90 degrees by, 21, um, by 2100 and 14 days above 100 degrees, which is really hard to imagine because we've actually never had a 100 degree day in Buffalo on the historic record. The highest degree day we've had is 99 degrees. Um, and so we are funded through a small sort of pilot grant to try to understand the thermal experience in our community. So we're using indoor and outdoor um, heat index sensors to try to capture those thermal conditions that we might consider to be objective, um, but then we're also trying to collect information about the subjective thermal experience through survey information. So we're collecting information about folks' baseline health, their building thermal performance, economic resources, um, knowledge, awareness they have about um, threats of heat and cold and the practices that they engage in, what kind of agency they may have to change those exposure and sensitivity conditions. And so, we're using this information to try to help us understand 
folks' experiences and the kinds of health and economic outcomes that they experience. So that's on the thermal experience side. On the thermal management side, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, we were funded um, through a National Science Foundation Smart and Connected Communities Planning Project um, to try to understand how smart technology could help support thermal management. And so on the research side, we have a very interdisciplinary team, including um, public health, computer science, climatology, architecture, and planning. And then um, with respect to local government agencies, we have a similarly broad representation across public health, emergency response, energy, environmental management, and land use. Um, and so we're trying to understand, you know, how can we um, um, use technology to support the wide-ranging goals of all these different agencies and, and researchers within the context of thermal management and really trying to use thermal management and thermal comfort as an organizing principle for breaking down some of the silos that often exist across these different disciplines. So, but we have a lot of conversations about, you know, what is the role of data um, and technology in this? And what we have, um, you know, really tried to um, create a lot of intentionality around in our, in our process is to not privilege the data and not privilege the technology that we're not looking to do like data, a data-driven project here. We're looking to do a value-driven project that's supported by data. And so the question, you know, the framing that we're using is um, how can technology support effective community networks? So the core um, activities of our project are to conduct forums that bring together all these different managers in um, cities in Tempe and Buffalo. And we were really fortunate that we timed our Buffalo Forum with a heat wave. And so we had like the commissioner of health and the manager of emergency response who were sort of multitasking, like sending out these messages that libraries were gonna have extended hours at cooling centers and so forth. But at the same time, there was another kind of message that folks in Buffalo were, were also you know, putting out there that um, we complained about the cold and now we shouldn't complain about the heat because you know, we'll just always be complaining about the weather, right? So there's a way in which there's a kind of um, cultural resistance to acknowledging that, um, t that temperature could pose a problem. So, okay, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna skip um, kind of quickly through. So we organize our forum around um, trying to have conversations about the importance of the problem naming what we don't know. So what are the gaps in our knowledge that smart technology could potentially help to fill? Um, who should be part of this conversation? Who isn't in the room? And then how can we create a vision? How can we create forward momentum? How can we work together to do that? And so some of the, the things that came out of these conversations is that temperature preparedness is a point of pride and part of our cultural understanding of place, but that we need to use um, storytelling and other efforts to communicate its urgency. Um, on the transportation side, we lack an understanding of what people experience between their homes and transit stops. St um, the housing stock can be um, a really important um, uh, context for supporting thermal comfort, but energy programs don't necessarily prioritize people who need them most. Um, we need to build a business case for managing heat and cold, and we need to work together across departments. Um, the health folks were really interested in home the idea of home monitoring systems. And so our vision includes energy affordability, thermal comfort, um, and collaboration. So these are kind of the, the values or the principles that are gonna be guiding the rest of our process. Um, and we have some ideas for how smart sensing can help us understand these kind of different dimensions of, um, of vulnerability, which I'd be happy to talk more about in the Q&A. Um, so I just want to make a couple quick reflections. So I think that there's a good case to be made that we can personalize measures of experiences and vulnerability and communicate those measures out to the managers who can, um, who can respond in real time. We can facilitate those information flows through smart technology, but that will not supplant the need to build relationships of trust and reciprocity. And I can go into a lot more detail about the kind of slow work that we've engaged in in trying to build trust and reciprocity on both the resident side and the management side, and that these should be value-driven processes and we should deploy these um, technologies ethically, and we, have to, we haven't yet figured out what that means, what is an ethical use of smart technology, and that our priorities are, are place-based. Okay, 
So I will conclude there. Thank you. Time for one quick question for Zoe. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, on your partners list, I noticed that you didn't uh, list the housing authority. I don't know if, is that a group that doesn't really, is there not a housing authority in Buffalo? Or um, if there was a reason that you hadn't, weren't working with them or if they just weren't on the list? Yeah, that's a good question. So we, um, we don't have a housing authority like in the same way that New York City has a housing authority where that's essentially like the size of a small city. But we do have like a LISC um, office in Buffalo that we're looking to work with. And yeah, we've been in contact with them, but we, it's not a partnership that we've fully developed yet. But yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I, one of the reasons that um, perhaps we haven't um, made that effort as much is that the, the people who are living in housing, that makes them more vulnerable to thermal impacts the housing is not like provided through that corporation. Um, and, and the housing that is provided through that corporation generally has air conditioning and is a little bit more um, weatherized. But yeah, it is, a, it is a relationship that we're looking to build. Thanks. Okay, um, thanks, Zoe. We will hold questions to the end, um, just in the interest of time. And I'd like to now introduce uh, Adam Heckman. Adam is the uh, Microsoft's Director of Technology and Civic Innovation for Chicago and Cleveland. And uh, he works with city civic leaders and communities to use technology to, to help solve city's biggest social challenges. Um, uh, Adam is an alum of the University of Illinois, got his degree in business administration from here, and um, has been with uh, Microsoft in Chicago since 1991. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Zoe. By the way, class of 1988. Um, I just want to take one minute and tell you a little bit about my job before we go and talk about City Tech Collaborative, and I think um, you'll understand why it's relevant in a little bit. Um, I work on the Microsoft Cities team, and what the Cities team does is we'll go into a city, in my case it's Chicago and a little bit of Cleveland, and we'll work with um, civic leaders, government leaders, community organizers, activists, um, to really understand at a very deep level where technology impacts, good or bad, some of the top civic priorities in a city. Um, I've been doing this for five years. Uh, I, my main focus areas are, first of all, computer science education, so how do you make sure that it gets equitably distributed so that um, in the future you have uh, computer scientists that look more like the city of Chicago looks. So how do you get more people of color? How do you get more females into the industry? I work on career pathways. What are the non-traditional career pathways that help match the unemployed and underemployed with skills that can let them participate in the economy very quickly? Uh, criminal justice reform. So. Uh, where does data and technology intersect with issues like reentry, recidivism, legal financial obligations, mass incarceration, things like that? And um, we also work on the civic tech movement. Um, and if you want to talk about the civic tech movement, it's a passion of mine. We can talk about it after this. The fourth area that I work on, it kind of overlays all of those, and that is um, the smart city space as it relates to a collaborative called the City Tech Collaborative um, that is part of UI Labs up in Chicago. So if you haven't been to UI Labs, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a consortium building organization on Goose Island. And the whole idea behind City Tech Collaborative is that it's this public-private academic partnership that defines and executes collaborative projects for the digital transformation in cities. And Bill mentioned um, that you know making Champaign-Urbana a test bed, that's what this does. We actually use the city of Chicago as a test bed 
for experiments and so that we, around smart cities, you know, energy, transportation, uh, physical infrastructure, water. And so we're validating these approaches to support the scaling of these solutions to other cities. So we test these things out in Chicago and then we expand it out. Uh, Microsoft was a founding partner of City Tech Collaborative back in 2015, and we helped design and establish the consortium, which includes now Microsoft and a number of other enterprise companies, uh, companies like Accenture, Here, ComEd, um, MasterCard, a number of others. It includes academics like University of Illinois, government, uh, many of the city's commissioners and a lot of the departments are there. And they're the key players, right? Because they're the ones who are validating that what we're coming up with, well, first of all, what we're working on are real issues, and that we're tackling them with reasonable solutions that can be deployed. So, uh, I'm a slide behind. I, just to give you an example of one of the cooler projects that we worked on, um, this, this one was called Underground Infrastructure Mapping. And, uh, oh, by the way, um, Arnab mentioned the Predictive Heat Vulnerability Index. That's another project that we're working on um, that's currently in the process. So we're working with U of I and we're working with NASA and a few other uh, partners. This one was really interesting. This one is already completed, underground infrastructure mapping. So the, the problem here is if you have cities like Chicago that are 150 plus years old, you kind of know what's underground, but you don't really know what's underground. So let's say that the cable company ha comes to um, you know, fix something downtown. What do they do that you, know, you block off a street and you have all these big machines that rip up the street and you go down and try to fix something and maybe you run into a 110-year-old telegraph cable, or you may run into and break something that the water department put in there, or maybe AT&T's got something down there that, you, that you've broken, and so what do you have to do? Well, you gotta fix that, and then you gotta pave it over, and you bring, it. Th the point is, it's very expensive, it's uh, very carbon intensive, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a problem that's in the billions of dollars. So here's how the, the solution that we've been working on. Um, what would happen if every time you open up the street, you have somebody take a series of about 200 pictures of what's down there, and then we send it down to a startup here at U of I, down at Enterprise Works, that puts all that stuff into a point cloud that is so incredibly detailed that you can even see things like a, a minor fissure in the, in the water pipe. Um, and then you have that third dimension. So today, the, we actually have an office of underground coordination. Believe it or not, a lot of the stuff that they do, if I'm um, the cable company and I'm coming in and telling them I need to do something, they have to look at all these maps and a lot of times, in fact, most of the time, they're 2D maps. Well, guess what? Turns out that that third D is, is pretty important to avoid the situations that we're talking about here. Um, so putting this into a point cloud that gives you that third dimension. And the other thing that this project does is it gives you um, a, a level of security, right? Because you want ComEd to know where people's gas assets are, and you want people's gas to know where the water department's assets are, but you don't want ISIS to know any of this, right? You want to make sure that you have the right level of security, so who's looking at this should be looking at it, and what do they have access to? So this underground infrastructure mapping um, project is uh, very, it's, it's important to, to, oh, oh, to cities too. Cities have an interesting revenue opportunity here because right now you have one permit fee for going underground. Now you can right size it. I'm not exactly sure who paid more, the people on the top or the people on the bottom, but the fact is that you can right size the way those permits work. And so this was a project that was a classic example of why 
you need these public-private academic partnerships. So if you can look on the, at the list here, you see that there's um, companies like Accenture who can commercialize this and sell this to cities. You have HBK who um, is the engineering company that has a lot of the contracts for what goes on underground. You have the utilities, you have the mapping companies, you have University of Illinois. So a lot of players here. So let's take a step back and talk about this consortium to begin with. Um, this is the process, this is the methodology that City Tech Collaborative uses. And it's oversimplified because obviously there's a lot of detail that goes underneath it. But the point is, could we, we, Microsoft, could, could we have done this project alone? Or more likely, could we have partnered with the University of Illinois and done this project alone? Maybe. Maybe we could have. We, here's what we would have had to do. We, had, we would have had to figure out who the right players were. We would have had to coordinate all those players. We'd have to get permission from the city of Chicago to actually take pictures underground and to figure out when that opportunity is going to be and to work out a data sharing agreement and to manage a process that's acceptable to the utilities and to the software companies and to the government and to the startups. Well, having this public-private partnership that has a built-in methodology with these key players means that we have something we can just plug into. So even if we could do this alone, we don't want to do this for every single pilot. So they have this framework that has the membership agreements and the data sharing agreements and the, uh, you know, the, a way to figure out the IP sharing agreements and all the processes and the facilitations in place. So when it comes time to do that predictive heat vulnerability index project, we just plug into it. Um, and it not only accelerates the pilot, but it makes it more likely that any smart city's solution is going to be validated with all the right players, right? It's one thing to, to validate it with the government and say, yeah, this thing is going to be something that is commercializable that you can go ahead and sell to other cities. It's another thing to make sure that it's acceptable to everybody else, like in that case, the utility players. So here's the program, um, and I'll let, you, I'll let you read. I'm assuming that these presentations are going to be made available. I'll let you read through this, but in the interest of time, let me just mention what the benefit is for each player. Um, first of all, we, we, we all have to agree that this is an opportunity, and then we get all the right cross-sector players involved. That's part of the benefit of being part of a public-private partnership. The second piece is that we get, get direct feedback from the people whose solutions these will ultimately benefit. A lot of times that's the government, but as I'm going to mention in the next slide, a lot of times it's the residents themselves. You have to be able to get the voice of the city resident into this, to make sure that what you're doing is not only something that'll benefit from them, that benefit them, uh, but something that they will feel comfortable with, and something that if they have questions on, those questions get answered. And again, we have a framework for the data sharing, which is a key part of the requirements for any smart city solution, but it also turns out to be a key part of the requirements for a public-private partnership. And then the facilitation to make that all happen. Here's some more examples of some of the pilots that we have um, either in process or completed. I know we, we're limited on time, so I'll just pick one of them. Um, smart grid infrastructure monitoring. As cities get, well, first of all, cities like Chicago built our sewer system long before we understood the concept of climate change, right? 100, 140 years ago. And as a city gets bigger, you're replacing green space with gray space. And what is asphalt? Well, asphalt is nothing more than a man-made river that channels water down into a sewer system, right? And so people have known for a long time that if you put more green space back in, that you can 
reduce some of the water that has to go into the sewer system and thereby um, reducing the opportunity for urban flooding, which is a very, very expensive and heartbreaking problem. So with the Smart Green Infrastructure Monitoring Project, we had uh, Microsoft and Accenture and a startup called Opti and um, a hydrologist from the University of Illinois and a guy who was uh, the, from U of I, a professor who is the world's leading expert on asphalt. I didn't even know you, that there was a way to measure that you're the world's leading expert on asphalt, but he's the guy and he was amazing. And um, the, the government players, streets and sanitation, the water department, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, et cetera. And what we did was we went to different neighborhoods in Chicago and tried different green elements. So for example, um, on Argyle Street, we, they, they, were gonna, they were gonna do some construction, so we talked to them and said, hey, instead of putting down asphalt, can you put down permeable pavers and let us put a layer of sensors underneath it so we can determine the, the moisture above ground and the moisture below ground, and then we can see what's getting absorbed. And if we wanted to, we could add sensors to see the quality of it to see the runoff. And then in another neighborhood, we put a bioswale. So we contoured the landscaping so that it, it made like a little hill and then in the trough we put native plants and we put a sensor box in that. And we did this over and over again, right? So the value of the public-private partnership is that we had a city that was willing to let us do things like tear up streets and put in sensors and, and do these measurements, et cetera. Um, and then we had the academics who were, had the smarts on all this and then we had companies like Microsoft that can provide the data analytics and companies like uh, Accenture that could commercialize it. And here, uh, there's a few other um, examples in here. The reason I wanted to go over my background of my job to begin with was there is a really important piece to the public part of a public-private partnership, and that's the resident's voice. Um, we recently, we being City Tech Collaborative, merged with the Smart Chicago Collaborative, which was one of the very first civic tech organizations in the country, um, and certainly was a, the catalyst for the civic tech movement in Chicago. And what that gave us was a few things. First of all, it gave us um, cut groups. Cut groups stands for um, uh, what does it stand for? Citizen usability testing, right? So citizen usability testing is a process by which you get direct feedback from the residents. You give them um, a little bit of incentive to participate with you, and you get the voices of the people that really matter. Those are the people who are, uh, uh, who are living in the city, who are taking advantage of the services, who rely on the infrastructure, et cetera. So this is for user research and for user design. And then it also gave us a group called Connect Chicago. Uh, Connect Chicago has a development methodology um, that helps us to not only make sure that we're doing the right things in the right way, but to source ideas to begin with from the residents. So um, things around improving access, improving people's skills, um, resident engagement with their government, residents utilizing technology to make sure their voices are heard, classic civic tech type of stuff. So gaining access to those things not only gives us a way to do our projects better and a way to, to implement some of the fundamental principles of democracy into these public-private partnership smart cities projects. Um, it also gives us a way to find new projects that we might not have uh, thought of just by having software companies and utility companies and engineering companies. We get the voice of the people. And so let me, let me finish this off by showing you some of the members that we have here in the, um, in the consortium. This does not include the departments of the city that have been involved, but we have the Department of Innovation and Technology involved, 
streets and sanitation, the water department, the planning department, the office of emergency management, the, um, the, the schools. I mean, it just, it, it runs the gamut. Department of Family and Social Services, uh, Family and Support Services, it runs the gamut. And having their voice as part of this not only validates that what we're looking at is real, it validates that what we're doing is scalable and scalable to other cities. You know, they talk to their peers in other cities. That smart green infrastructure monitoring project, which is designed to um, reduce urban flooding, we validated that that's not only appropriate for Chicago, but it's appropriate for um, for Paris, and it's appropriate for Chattanooga, and it's appropriate for insert city on a body of water here somewhere. Um, by the way, I was shocked to see that uh, when, last when I went, went to school here, Boneyard Creek was a thing. Now you've you've done this amazing thing with it, and you didn't disturb it, but you put a walkway over it, and that's really interesting. Anyway, I digress. With that, I will take questions. Start, if you can start by telling me your first name, that would be great. Hi, I'm Anita, undergraduate. Um, yeah, my question is, um, so what kind of conversations are taking place about replacing or retrofitting, retrofitting new smarter architecture around old architecture? Like, there's this infrastructure underground that's being mapped, but is there a conversation happening about how that's going to have to change in order to replace and bring up to standard new architecture and new smart technologies? How is that, is there a conversation happening around that? Yeah, that's, that's a terrific question. The answer is that all, that's always a question that gets raised in any of these projects. For some of the projects you have, uh, for things like transportation, it's a viable um, option. It's an expensive option, but it's a viable option to have a long-term um, thought process around replacing, um, replacing buses with different kinds of buses or replacing the trains with different types of trains. It's not viable today to re-architect the entire sewer system. Right now, the sewer system is a, um, it's a, uh, what, do you, what do you call it when it's one, it, it, what is it? Combined. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Don't know why that one. It's a combined sewer system. You can't really start from scratch in a city of three million people and um, change that into uh, a separated sewer system. So the architecture question um, always gets tied into the viability question. But it's it's there on every project. Or not? Um, so a two-part question perhaps bridges this consortium building with civic tech work. I'm curious what your thoughts are regarding not upscaling but downscaling some of these models to smaller and medium-sized communities like Champaign Urbana. And the other part of the question is whether civic tech could be sort of a framework to, to do some of those things. Let me take the second part of your question first. Civic tech is absolutely a framework for some of this because, it, 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 is everybody familiar with civic? Okay, so let me, uh, civic tech is a social, a, a very 21st century social movement where people who have skills in some area of technology, developer, data, design, um, and they want to provide those skills, they want to provide their resources for public good. A lot of times it means working with the government, not for the government, but working with the government because it's around issues of um, uh, democracy and issues of you know, daily life in, uh, in the city and equity issues, et cetera. Um, those movements are happening in not just the big cities, but um, in mid-sized and smaller cities as well. 
Um, I've worked with the civic tech movement in Louisville, and they happen to be doing some amazing um, uh, forward-thinking work. And it fits into these smart cities projects for exactly the reason that you, you're, you're saying. You want to make sure that these projects scale. And oddly enough, it's not the pilots, or, I'm sorry, it's not the actual um, execution of or building the project itself that makes it difficult in smaller cities. It's that sometimes smaller cities don't have the resources to collect the data. And if they do have the resources to collect the data, a lot of times it's in a format that's very cumbersome to be able to use on some of these projects. Um, there are small cities that have all of their data in PDFs. You know, so what, what do you do with that? So in some cases, it's like the open data movement sort of precedes the smart cities movement for, um, for cities of that size. Vanessa's, uh, there it goes. There we go. Um, so what is the decision-making process when maybe someone from the public suggests a project or, or suggestions come from all over? What's the decision-making process for what you will tackle and then the funding that goes with that? Yeah. And are you working on any like real grand challenges that are going to involve environment, public health, education, et cetera, et cetera, or is it better to do these sort of incremental, more manageable projects and sort of build build up? Four questions in one. Where do you want to start? Let, let's start, should we start? Decision, funding, okay, so, grand yeah, challenge. So that's the other piece that makes a consortium like the City Tech Collaborative really, really good because they have a specific framework of boxes you have to check, right? Um, it, you know, it, for example, it can't be a substitute for going to RFP for something. It has to be something net new, right? Um, it has to be something that is uh, validatable and validatable that it's not just for Chicago, that other areas can benefit from it. it uh, for the enterprise partners, it has to be something that's commercializable. Yeah, so there's all of that. Um, the funding model is, it, it depends on the project, but um, almost always it's a, it's a pay to play model. The enterprise companies that um, go into these projects, fund these projects with real money, but then we also provide resources, like Microsoft provides the cloud resources with Azure. Um, we have partners that um, really excel at uh, project management, so each one has a project manager. Each one has a SME, a subject matter expert. Um, that they're contributing to this. Here Maps um, is one of our newer uh, members and they have been incredibly valuable when it comes to geospatial. And then the, the I, what was the fourth question? Oh, yes, so you had mentioned grand challenges and you had mentioned it in the context of health. Interestingly enough, when we took on Smart Chicago Collaborative, one of the things we took, we got from them was the Chicago Health Atlas. If you have not seen the Chicago Health Atlas, look at it, chicagohealthatlas.org, because it pulls together all of these, I think there's 167 indicators. They're around health, but they're also around the tangential things that impact health, right? So they're around, like I can see where all of the, I can see where all of the, um, or where, the, where there's a greater incidence of diabetes and hypertension. And then I can overlay that on the, uh, with data on where the food deserts are. And so, no surprise, you see a correlation, and also no surprise, you see that that's more predominant on the west and south sides. So is there an opportunity for some organization, could be us, but it could be any organization, to work on getting more fresh produce on the west and south sides. So these are things that are real game changers in major issues. Um, and as far as the environmental issues um, come, 
Yeah, I mean, when we're looking at things like um, uh, congestion release, congestion relief, we're not just looking at it because it's a pain in the tush for somebody to drive through the city. We're doing that because 60% of the carbon that comes from cars is when a car is idle, right? So there are environmental issues on, I would say, the majority of our projects. Really, really exciting stuff. And to give our last speaker time. Uh, our last speaker. Uh, our last speaker for the session is Brad Lane. And Brad is the Director of Business Development and the Internet of Things Smart Cities organization. He leads the business development and go to market efforts for this emerging business unit in AT&T's Internet of Things division. Uh, he's been with AT&T since 2003, and he's going to talk about strategies for, for smart cities. Thanks, Brad. All right. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. You saved me three minutes of my uh, presentation here. So I know it's cliche, uh, but I know lunch is waiting for you outside those doors or somewhere down the hall. Um, but today, I want, to, um, I want to go over a lot of these smart cities strategies that we've been dealing with the last three, three and a half years at AT&T. So I'm going to give you a couple fun facts on like this IoT momentum, why this smart cities, why this IoT is a buzzword, which by the way, IoT, it, it, it definitely is a buzzword. Um, it's nothing new though. We used to call it M to M or machine to machine. You have carriers uh, like AT&T and our peers out there that were already turning down 2G machine to machine networks, migrating them over these IoT, 4G LT, and soon to be 5G networks. So, um, and I want to spend a good amount of time on funding strategies. So I know that may sound a little boring right now, but uh, you know, I, I want to do that because guys like myself, companies like AT&T, our peers in the industry, we're frustrated. The cities we're calling on, they're frustrated because we know all this technology works right now. But the main issue right now, the 500 pound gorilla in the room, is how do you fund it? And then more importantly, how do you contract and procure that or whatever? So I want to share with you a lot, about, a lot of time my team is spending and our peers in the industry with these city managers and mayors trying to figure out how we get this technology into your city, onto these campuses, into these businesses to really start making a difference. Uh, and then I'm going to finish with a really cool technology strategy that, that um, cities can deploy called digital infrastructure. And I will bullet point this. So everything I talk about, I promise you I will not try to make this, or I, it's not intended to be an AT&T sales pitch. Everything I talk about today, they're real concepts, they're offerings there, and all of our peers in the industry do offer similar or like concepts as well. Uh, and I will try to keep the acronyms at bay, but you guys see that AT&T logo and we just talk in acronyms. So why the heck is an AT&T guy up here, right? Um, hopefully. A lot of you aren't like my 81-year-old mother who still thinks I work for the phone company because nothing could be further from the truth right now, all right? So um, about three years ago, or back in 2015, there were nine of us tasked with sitting down and coming up with a strategy, a framework on how we leverage AT&T's core strengths, how we leverage our strategic alliance members, and more importantly, how we leverage our relationships that we've built up over decades and decades with all these city and municipalities. And so what we came up with was this, uh, and, and by the way, AT&T, we were the first carrier to launch a smart cities practice back in 2015, and then our peers in the industry soon followed after that. Um, so what we came up with is this framework strategy, right? So framework is another buzzword in smart cities, but it works, it's tried and true. And we sat down with our strategic alliance members. We sat down with a bunch of city uh, managers and mayors and said, hey, listen, we want to use your city to deploy these pilots, the smart cities technology. We're not sure if it's going to work yet, but we have a good idea um, what problems it may solve. And so in early 2016, we announced a, uh, what we call the AT&T Spotlight Cities Initiative. And we took it out to eight cities and one college campus, and we deployed everything from connected bus shelters to Wi-Fi on buses to help bridge that digital divide, um, smart irrigation, smart lighting, digital kiosks. We tried revenue share models and everything. We tried it all. We figured out what worked back in 2015, 2017, and now we're, we're, we're finally at the stage, I think, after all these pilots and all these talking and, all, and talking about it and all these press releases of these pilots that you know kind of just died away shortly after, um, we're finally in a place now where this technology really does work that can solve real city problems. 
So this isn't to uh, beat my chest or AT&T's chest. I used a slide for a comparison to the next slide. And right now, today, AT&T, we are the largest cellular IoT provider in North America, and we go back and forth between number two and number three globally. So we battle out with Vodafone because our technology, what we call permanently roams in 200 countries, just like Vodafone's. Number one is China Mobile, no secret there, but we really don't compete with them because we're not allowed to permanently roam in China yet. So we go back and forth, um, and I use this slide as comparison because if AT&T is the largest cellular provider of IoT devices, which encompasses all the smart cities, the connected car, the drones, the asset tracking, healthcare, all those IoT applications, this is where it's going right now, right? So IoT is not a buzzword, it is not going, even though I just said it was earlier, it's not going away, it's actually getting ready to explode right now. And I've been using this slide um, for about three years now, and I, I, I keep it in my deck um, because if you look at that line in the sand by 2020, what's interesting about that, that's where all the, that's where all the carriers drew the line in the sand and said, hey, we're gonna have 5G deployed nationally by 2020, right? And then all the European and all the foreign PTTs, they're, they're on that same map, some sooner than others. Um, so 5G in the IoT world is really gonna be the proliferation of IoT. And one of the reasons of that is because in that 5G standard, and you guys can write this down, this is a new technical term in IoT, is part of that standard is what they call massive IoT adoption. Um, and it's for the, for not going in too much detail, but think of all those smart meters out there, your, your traditional IoT sensors that can get deployed where these devices are so slick now, they got like a 10 year battery life and they come with a SIM card that may only cost 25 to 45 cents a month. So think of your smart meters, right? Smart metering like lighting, that's low hanging fruit in smart cities right now. We know that works. Um, so part of that 5G standard is to accommodate this massive growth in these IoT, what we call low power wide area devices. Um, so now I'm gonna dive into one particular, you know, this, this uh, P3 or these public-private partnerships, this is gaining a lot of steam right now in the industry. And so there's so many different facets of a P3. This is one of them um, that we announced in uh, San Jose a few months ago. We just announced this in LA a few weeks ago. One of our competitors announced this in Sacramento. Um, but this is real, this is gaining steam, and, uh, gaining steam, and this is one way for cities to deploy smart cities te technology with very little to no cost to the taxpayers. And so this is um, what is not, it's not a rate negotiation, all right? This is from a very high level non-technical, this is the barter system, okay? Carriers like AT&T and our peers, we wanna deploy 5G as fast as we can. We are willing, able, and ready right now to load up all these 5G small cells that's making all the news because the states are ticked off at the carriers and the government's stepping in and they wanna help us accelerate this. Um, but we are literally bartering smart cities technology, um, any type of technology, sensors, consulting, security, smart lighting, revenue share models. And in return, we want assistance on attachment rates. Legal didn't let me use the word free or discounted, but that's what we want, right? We don't, um, it's, it's all over the board. Cities, there's some cities that wanna charge us $350 for an attachment rate for a small cell, all the way to $1,500. Uh, for a small cell. So what we're looking to do is come in with the cities, partner with them, we'll deploy evenly like service types, not like services, but smart cities technology at a certain dollar amount. And we would like expedited permit processes, assistant with attachment rates. Um, we'll even go as far as help you put additional folks on payroll um, or help cities put additional folks on payroll to process those permits or whatever. This is, um, to date, that we know of, this is the largest public-private partnership uh, in the world right now. And so this was born out of the FirstNet Authority, which is a government agency. They released an RFP um, a few years back. Um, surprisingly, AT&T was one of the only, a lot of people bid on this RFP, but AT&T was the only carrier uh, to bid on this RFP. We were, we were awarded this, and the government gave us this really good coveted spectrum, right? So in my world, spectrum is king right now. 
And the purpose of this RFP was to build a first responder cellular network, a cellular network dedicated to first responders out, out there that gives them priority, priority and preemption so that what happened in 9-11, the Boston Marathon, and all these natural disasters, hurricanes and everything, first responders can get through. Um, so we classify first responders, we set them up as primary users and extended primary users. So primary users, um, think of police, fire, and ambulance, right? They get the really good, what we call black sims or whatever, um, that give them always on priority and preemption. And then you have your extended primary users, so think of your utilities, your hospitals, your transportation, so if and when in the event, they have an orange sim, we call it, um, in my world, and in the event of a disaster, these primary users can uplift these extended primary users to get that priority and preemption. Um, and so, you know, the one thing I want to point out, uh, we're, we're very excited about this, um, that we won this award, but this is not AT&T's network. This is the first net network. This is the first responders network. So right now in my world, there's, you don't have four major carriers in the U.S. right now. You have five. There's AT&T, Timo, Verizon, Sprint, and now FirstNet or whatever. So AT&T's part in this is we are building this network, we are maintaining this network, and we are enhancing this network. This is not a P3, but this is what we call, this is gaining popularity right now. This is another way for cities to implement all this cool smart city technology at very low upfront cost to the taxpayers um, where you can get this technology deployed now. We come in, we call this a, um, call them funding models, unique funding models, finance models and everything. Every one of these is custom right now. So there's a city on the west coast of Florida that just sent out an RFP with this, requesting this type of model. There's another RFP that's gonna drop up in upstate New York. This is gaining popularity right now. This is for really, um, uh, funding or budget uh, cities with uh, little to no budget, right? So this, this, this model helps them deploy smart city technology. And so what we'll do, we can customize this many ways. We put together all these best of breed companies in here. Um, you know, smart cities capital in this picture, like they're one of the finance guys. We got GE capital that we can bring in. And we can install technology in these cities on these campuses we can prove out that there's gonna be a revenue savings, and then we get a piece of that savings back. So if you're saving, you know, smart lighting's one, smart meters, that's some low-hanging fruit. Believe it or not, you know, a lot of people in the industry were sick of talking about smart lighting, the LED replacements, right? I still love talking about it right now because we've only swapped out 20% of our LEDs. To me, that's crazy, and I'm, I'm, and I'm kind of a little frustrated while well, the utilities own half the poles, the cities own half the poles, and all this stuff, right? So. I don't understand why this hasn't gone faster, but this is the way to expedite that, all right? There's a lot of capital investment that goes into swapping out those LEDs. That's the main issue. We can help solve that problem. Um, again, this is a way where you can, lower the, you can lower your bills monthly. You can install this smart, um, all, all this smart city capital with no money out of taxpayers' pockets. So the last three slides I have um, is a strategy called that we call digital infrastructure. And so what this is trying to um, eliminate is, if you think back to that hockey stick chart there, right? So you don't wanna be the city manager, the mayor, or the CIO, or the IT director of a city. When you wake up in five to 10 years down the road and you have all these siloed departments that deployed their own sensors, you've got 10 different IoT networks in your city, some of them are public facing, some of them are private, some of them are wide open, to, to hackers and everything, you want to avoid that scenario. And so this is one way to do that right now. We can come in, this is a partnership between AT&T, best in breed in connectivity and security, GE, best in breed in um, uh, commercial manufacturing, and Intel, who's best in breed in compute power. So these are definitely, they act like, um, picture them as little smartphones, they're little computers that we hang on the light poles. This is all the cool technology in them, Here's how they work in action. Um, so if you think of these right now, what this is doing, smart cities, 
it's all about the data, right? It's all about capturing that data. And then Smart Cities 2.0, some will argue it's like Smart Cities 3.0, is that actually taking that data and making it actionable, right? This is one of the infrastructures that it takes a thought leader to implement this. This is expensive. We currently have this in three cities today and one port authority and it's going in another three cities in the next four months. Um, but this is the way to capture all that data. And what I like about this is, I'll give you a small sales pitch here, is here's how it works, right? Mr. City, Mrs. City, we want you to buy that intelligent node that goes on that light pole, right? But we're not asking you to get in a 10, 20, uh, a 5, 10, 20 year relationship with us. You go, those inte that, this intelligent infrastructure works like a smartphone. So you can go and contract with all these companies individually. So if you wanna do a, an easy example here is a parking app, right? The days of putting pucks in pavement where the vendors are telling you you're gonna get like six, eight, 10 years of battery life, that's, that's crazy, those days are over, all right? Um, so now you can go out, get an RFP for some kind of parking app. Let's say you award that parking app to Parking Panda, right? They win that RFP. Parking Panda now doesn't have to go and deploy all their sensor technology. What they're gonna do, they can utilize these, oh, sorry guys. There it goes. So if you look to the far, or you're far right there, Parking Panda's technology can utilize these intelligent nodes. And so the one thing it clearly solves for is what we call the Christmas tree effect, right? You have all these sensors gonna be deployed, your, your, your light poles or whatever, your towers are gonna look like Christmas trees. It's not very aesthetically pleasing. All this technology is housed in that node. So what Parking Pan is doing now is they're loading up their software back at the parking headquarters and away they go. In one or two years when that contract's out, if you weren't happy with Parking Panda, you can load up, you, you literally delete them like an app and you can load up Park Mobile um, like that. So a lot of stuff, there isn't, a, uh, there isn't a police, we try to get the police chief in these meetings for these. There isn't a police chief out there that doesn't want extra cameras on the scene. Um, you know, one of the low hanging fruits on this as well is uh, we've all heard it too, which is starting to get, a, um, people are getting sick of hearing about it, but shot spotter, acoustic gunshot detection. You don't need all those shot spotter devices deployed in the city, they can leverage these. And so how this works right now is that that gunshot goes off, this device will detect that and immediately make a call to the 911 center, the PSAP center, and now there's not one but two cameras in these where they have eyes on there and they can start recording. Um, you can even modify the poll, so in the back of these intelligent nodes, it, you know, the question always comes up with first responders and police is, what about LPR, or license plate recognition, right? Well, you're not gonna mount LPR 20, 30 feet high, right? That doesn't make any sense. You can mount that lower on the pole and you can tie any of these intelligent nodes. Um, and with that, I must be hungry because I went quick. Um, any questions? Great, great presentation. Go, going back to the, uh, your slide on defining PPP, and if you take, and I always look at, at, at initiatives like this through um, the lens of equity. It, if you take IoT out of this, is this also an opportunity to um, start to fill the, uh, the, broad, the digital divide in terms of the broadband gap um, internet access for people in neighborhoods that are, tend to not have access to it. Is, that, is, is there a place in this for that type of an issue? And, you know, the short answer is absolutely, right? And so uh, the purpose, the main driver for us behind this model here is to deploy 5G. And so another standard that got baked into 5G is wireless broadband. So all those places, as the carrier, especially in our incumbent states, we get asked all the time, like we have these broadband deserts in certain parts of the area, and it's very, very expensive to dig up the street and lay fiber. It's gonna be a whole heck of a lot cheaper when 5G is deployed all over that to beam that um, broadband in. So I think the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, great presentation, thank you. Uh, when you work with municipal agencies, do you work with a single nodal agency uh, or multiple agencies at once? And in either model, what are the strongest silos to bust in your experience? 
<laughs> well, it's a loaded question. Um, yeah, so we, the Smart Cities team, um, it's, it's, it's kind of unique. Uh, we overlay a lot of what we call our segment sellers who are traditionally positioned in that IT department, in that CIO's office. But how cities are run today, we really try to get into that city manager. Um, my team and I, we spend the majority of our time taking requests from city managers, if not mayors. Um, I've met with probably a couple dozen mayors over the last three years and about 120 city managers. But a lot of this technology, because cities are still in that siloed approach, right? They have their own budgets, they even have their own IT guys. Um, you got to get to that thought leader up top that's going to roll down that, you know, kind of not rule with an iron fist, but really motivate these siloed departments to get on board with some of this stuff. And I think you see um, it, it's, it's, it's not hard to, when, when you see these, um, all these press releases with Smart City, the actual, the, the good ones that are out there, all the cities that are leading in this, you know, you have a mayor or a city manager or some newly uh, appointed commissioner that's been a thought leader in the smart city space. So I would say, no, we absolutely as a smart cities team, especially with the P3 model and these unique funding models, um, it's, it's in the mayor's office. You talked about, uh, you know, you had these eight pilot cities and in the last two years you completed those pilot studies. Um, how quickly do you think this will go from pilot to actual uh, implementation? And then how long would it take to go beyond the eight larger cities to mid-sized cities? Yeah, so I didn't ask her to ask that question, but that, that's a great softball question. So I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you. We're, we're sick of pilots, all right? Pilots costed us a lot of money. We know this stuff works, right? We have very little budget left to go and deploy this pilot technology. Um, we have... A lot of partners out there, some of them on AT&T paper, we can do full solutions on AT&T paper, but we just did a lot of the larger, what we would call NFL cities, because we had that really good urban use case in parts of those cities. But this technology, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're Chicago, it doesn't matter if you're Champaign, it doesn't matter if you're um, Park Ridge or um, Lakewood, Ohio, my hometown, a town of 50,000 constituents. So th this technology is here, it's ready. Um, and it plays in the campus environment, too. So, I mean, campuses are 100% um, cities of themselves. You heard about how autonomous vehicles might be here sooner than we think, and how would that, that would increase requirements to be connected to the internet and all of, yeah. you know. How, is that something that you are anticipating and planning on developing capacity for, or is that, yeah, no, good, good question too. So, um, and the short answer to that is 5G, right? So you hear me talk about these 5G standards. There's three main pillars of 5G. The first one is wireless broadband, right? So I addressed Adam's question where that's gonna help us bridge the digital divide because now you don't need fiber, you don't need cable. We can beam some really good high speed, secure internet access into these homes. So uh, wireless broadband is one pillar. Um, and the second pillar we talk about is AI, AV, so artificial intelligence and autonomous vehicles or whatever. So that infrastructure, the majority of those are going to ride off of, is going to be in some way, shape, or form start or eventually end up on a 5G network. Because now you're talking like, you know, single digit milliseconds, right, instead of double digit milliseconds. Um, and you can see how critical that is, especially with autonomous vehicles. I mean, a, a couple milliseconds can mean um, the difference between a fender bender or, or life and death. So um, again, answer to that question is 5G. And a lot of fiber too. But 5G to start. Thinking about 5G and all the data that's going to be generated, has AT&T or the groups that you're working with thought about what the data center infrastructure looks like on the back end and how to handle that going forward in larger cities? Yes. <laughs> Lunchtime. <laughs> nice. Um, Yes, of course, um, not my expertise, uh, but you know, as you can see, where a really cool part of my job, let me answer it this way, a really cool part of my job is I interact with uh, what were once competitors right now, right? We've all, we've all heard the frenemies, um, uh, the frenemies word. And 
with our partners, like AT&T has data centers, but you know, we have partnerships um, and services that we can directly hook into AWS. So the majority of these IoT deployments that I do, a lot of those IoT, to, um, that data ends up in an AWS, an Azure, or an IBM uh, cloud storage provider because we can prove that data, the minute it leaves this device and hits that cell tower, that cell tower is going to recognize that being unique to whatever company it is and send it on a private APN and never touch a public internet. So I know I'm getting into security, I didn't answer, answer your question, but um, our product folks are constantly sitting, you know, we have a whole team at AWS, um, Azure, IBM that sit down with our product folk teams and we're constantly working on that stuff. We, we can't hire enough data science or whatever, data scientists or whatever. Like if, there, if I can, you know, I got three kids right now and they go to Code Learn Play and during the summer. They don't go away to sleepaway camp. They go to Code Learn Play because if I can do one thing, get one of them to be a coder, they're gonna have a coder or some kind of big data scientist, they're gonna have a job for life. Um, so definitely an emerging and, and much needed uh, you know, skill set. All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Before noon, so uh, just want to open it up to questions to any of our other presenters, and uh, maybe just a question for Bill. Um, you know, when you think about making campus smarter, uh, you know. Uh, we're still not perhaps using technologies that are already available. And so Evan was just raising this question of why don't we have more uh, light detector, you know, motion detector systems here just to increase our uh, energy efficiency. So how much of the, uh, you know, uh, what we have, the technology we have on campus is constrained on resources to deploy current technologies as it is a constraint on figuring out how we can use emerging technologies to, to make our campus smarter. Gets to what kinds of things you're working on, but so let me understand the question. Is your question um, there are a number of low hang there's a number of technologies that we haven't employed that are relatively low hanging. Why would we do something like this? So um, with respect to the question of resource constraint. What's the constraining resource? Is it that we don't have the money? Um, is it, or is it that we've organized ourselves uh, as a state of Illinois in which we cannot uh, legally um, take advantage of the cost savings that we would get by doing some of these really smart things that you know homeowners can do and businesses can do, but we can't capture the cost savings because, we're, because of the way we account for money in the state of Illinois and buy something that would, and employ it, that would save an enormous amount of money in the long run, because we're, because we're straight-jacketed by the rules and regulations of procurement in the state of Illinois. It makes no sense. We need, to, we need to get our urban planners together with the legal folks, and we need to change a whole bunch of policies and laws that, re, that well, that aren't smart, that, are, that cost us money in the long run, because we have, we have uh, 19th century accounting systems that were put in place because we've got so much corruption history in this state that keep us from doing, from making sound investments. Uh, of course, what economists like to hear is sort of thinking about how you can improve the incentives and the policies of the institutions so that it becomes worthwhile and you can actually account for all of these costs and recover some of that if you move to better technologies, so. Right, the technologies exist and we know how to, the, the technologies exist, we know how to employ them, um, but we don't have funding models that free, that allow us to free up some uh, the savings that we'd capture. And some of the payback periods on these, on these technologies are incredibly short, three, four, five, six years. We could have it paid for, and then we could have all these years of savings, but we can't free that money up. Yes. Any other questions for our, any of our panel speakers? Yeah. I do have a general question um, for the Smart Cities panelists. 
Um, most of the, the pilots and models that I've seen have been deployed in larger cities, which have control over transit and some of the uh, services that really benefit uh, from smart cities. How does it apply to, say, suburban communities where a lot of the services that are going to benefit from smart technologies or, or can be monitored by smart technologies are um, fragmented with other agencies. For example, a suburban community um, would be governed by PACE for financing, might be another water reclamation facility or uh, agency um, that is providing services and might have uh, things like trash hauling um, contracted out. So I'm just curious about how um, it works with communities and if there's a regional approach of the guy from at and um, Can you hear me on this? Uh, and I'm sorry, can you overview of that question again? I was back here in a conversation. I, I missed half that. So how, the how, general, how does the communities differentiate from general, these large cities? A uh, general question is how is smart cities technologies um, uh, uh, useful for communities that are suburban to a metro area? So for example, I, I represent the Chicago region. Chicago would make sense and is part of the Internet of Things, but then how does it work for a suburban community? You mentioned Park Ridge. So how does Park Ridge then participate and benefit in smart cities technologies beyond the city when they're not involved in transit and they might have separate agencies that are doing other services that like the flooding uh, monitoring effects and the stormwater impacts and the health impacts and the trash, uh, you know, the full trash can impacts and things like that when you might have vendors, a lot of, it's not centralized. So how does, how does that all work? Is the, is the responsibility for making those connections on the municipality or Talk to me a little bit more about um, about engaging some of those other uh, agencies and partners. Okay, yeah. So we'll work. My team will will work with any agency, any partner um, that wants to solve some kind of use case. So a lot of it starts out as a lot of the requests we get are for that ex exact reason. What you said. Here's our use case. How can you help us? Right. So we sit down. We get a seat at the table to have an initial conversation. But when you look at you know, your example of Park Ridge, um, all these, all the suburbs have the same, most of the same issues as some of these urban environments, just on a lot smaller scale. Um, so what I didn't bring today is I was, I didn't want to make this an AT&T sales pitch, but there's so many technologies like smart irrigation, smart lighting, smart water meters and everything, that it doesn't matter if you're 8,000 constituents or 800,000 constituents. The technology still works, it still solves a problem, it still reduces congestion, it reduces the carbon footprint. Um, so, again, where the side of the table I'm on, it's, it, it, it's the same, whether you're the city of Chicago or Park Ridge. I mean, it's just, a, it's just a lot smaller implementation in Park Ridge than it would be the entire larger city. So I, but I don't think I'm answering your question on that. I mean, we get, we work with parks and recs all the time, right? So here's a perfect example. We work, we target parks and recreation because those are the folks that have, are responsible for their irrigation system, right? So every city manager I talk to, there's not one city manager that's been in place for over two years that hasn't got the call from a ticked off constituent because a sprinkler head, when it's 85 degrees on a Saturday, is shooting seven feet up in the air, right? So we have technologies to replace that dumb irrigation box with a smart irrigation box that will know that it shouldn't be watering at that time and shut that off and send an alert to Parks and Rec that, hey, some kid or some lawnmower just uh, kicked off the sprinkler head and it, it needs to be fixed because the next time the irrigation system kicks on, it's gonna be a geyser. Um, but that's just one example. But we have, whether it's public safety, um, whether it's civic engagement and everything, uh, we work with, so you know, a perfect example is Fishers, Indiana, right? So from a civic engagement, we work with a couple of their tech incubators. We do hackathons there um, once a year. Now, I think Fishers is really, they have a mayor there. Mayor Fadness is a, definitely a thought technology leader in that community, and he helps make that happen. Um, but these are, we had a hackathon in Fishers, Indiana that was larger than the hackathon we hosted at our flagship store on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. So um, every, every city is unique. Every city, um, every city, every deal we do with a city is some, is, there's some kind of customization in there. So all the vendors in my space, it's really the 70-30 rule, 80-20 rule, where all these smart cities technologies, and again, you keep hearing me say the ones that work, right? Um, because there's a lot out there that are just a good press release and that's it. But the ones that work um, are about 70% baked, and then we gotta customize the last 
30 to 20 percent. I'll end here. Please join me in thanking all of our speakers one more time.